think we should start right now. Um, so I'm Jun Yang, I'm Associate Professor at Moran Eye Center. So today uh, I'm going to introduce our speaker at this grand rounds. So, um, so today we are honored to have Dr. John Flannery here on campus to give us two talks. One is this grand rounds and the other is our department distinguished speaker research seminar at noon. So if you have time, you're welcome to join us at noon. So Dr. John Flannery is currently the professor of uh, reading science, molecular and cellular biology, and uh, neuroscience at Helen's, uh, Helen Wills Neuroscience Institute at UC Berkeley. Uh, he obtained his uh, bachelor's and uh, PhD degrees from UC Santa Barbara where he conducted a study with Dr. Stephen Fisher uh, doing uh, research on uh, circadian disc shading from photoreceptors in Xenopus retina. And then he did his postdoc training with Dr. Uh, Ding Bach and Dr. Deborah Farber at the Julie Sting Eye Institute at UCLA. And during this time, he developed the first human RPE cell culture system which is still in use in several laboratories today. And also he conducted uh, one of the first transgenic rescue experiments for RD1 mouse. And in 1991, he studied his, po uh, his faculty position in of, uh, in Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Florida. And in 1994 or five, he moved his laboratory to UC Berkeley. Uh, so the long-term research interests of Dr. Uh, Flannery are the genetic and the biochemical aspects of inherited retinal degenerations and develop treatments, gene therapies for this group of diseases. Um, his lab studied the normal retinal function and uh, disease diseases by developing and characterizing small and large animal models and also design and uh, um, develop um, developed various viral vectors and the promoters to target different retinal cells. Um, so uh, they recently uh, developed uh, optogenetic optogene gene therapy by delivering, delivering optically switched receptors and ion channels into retinal ganglion cells and bipolar cells. And uh, Dr. Flannery is right now um, a vice chair of scientific advisory board of Foundation Finding Blindness. And um, he was also once the associate and acting dean of, uh, an acting director of Highland Mills uh, Neuroscience Institute at the UC Berkeley. So uh, Dr. Uh, Flannery has published more than 150 papers and uh, received numerous awards, including the Board of Directors Awards from uh, Foundation Funding Brightness. Now let's welcome Dr. Flannery. So the title. Thanks, June. Thanks for coming. Um, this is clearly not the title. Thanks for inviting me. I changed the title from your program. Um, what I'd like to do this morning is, uh, in November, I was uh, invited to Roche um, in Basel for a set of talks where they wanted to have about 12 people come, different uh, clinicians and basic scientists, and tell them about where they should be or where they should try to be in the next five years. And this is, this is the Roche that owns Lucentis, so I kind of felt like they were doing okay. <clears throat> but they said, uh, you know, we were sure that injecting Lucentis every six weeks in patients is not going to last forever, and so we want to start thinking about what to do in the future. So, of course, since they're Swiss, they had to change the title of my talk, something that they <laughs> like, and put their logo on it. But then they said, as soon as we got there, they arranged the meeting so that everybody sat in a circle, you had to wear a headset to talk. It was very much like a TED talk. They were trying to be really hip, even though they're Swiss. Um, <laughs> And then they said this thing that's a very loaded term in San Francisco. They said, we really want you here the next day and a half to be disruptive. And when we think of disruptive in the Bay Area, we think of like three first year residents, like in a garage making an app. And you know, this is where we are, right? They have two 40 story buildings, they have thousands of people. They're like the less, least disruptive people on the planet. 
Anyway, um, I thought I, for the next half hour I'll give you the talk that I gave as sort of a where would ophthalmology it may be going as far as the kinds of projects that we work on in my lab over the next couple of years. So one of the things that's become quite clear over the last couple of decades, particularly in my role working with the Foundation Fighting Blindness, is that initially Ted Dreija and Peter Humphreys found in the 80s the first gene that was causative for retinitis pigmentosa, which is a P23H mutation in rhodopsin, which is a kind of dear to my heart because it's an Irish immigrant that was the founder that came to the United States. So this is not found in the UK. The first patient with this is American. Anyway, everybody thought, oh, we found the first RP gene, we're finished. People that do medical retina have been a little bit too good at this, so now they're up to 265 different causative genes for retinitis pigmentosa. And Steve Dager in Texas has to maintain a web page, which basically changes every day as people find new causative genes for inherited eye diseases. The good thing about this, if you think about it, is that this looks like it's actually plateauing, and people that do medical genetics say that this is probably all the genes for most of the large families. There's still gonna always be small uh, families that aren't on this list, and there are always gonna be new random mutations. But the numbers, 275, is probably somewhere in the ballpark. It's not gonna be twice that. Now that we know a large number of the genes of patients that come in the clinic with progressive blinding diseases, you can start looking at what they encode, and what you can see is that they encode almost every biochemical process in a basic biochemistry textbook. You can find mutations in mitochondria, in uh, ciliopathies for making the structural proteins of cilia, lipid metabolism, almost anything that you can think of, there's a set of patients that have a mutation in that. And so all these together sort of lead to the same clinical phenotype is that the patients lose photoreceptors. These mutations kill photoreceptors. And so what you see in a combination between looking at the genetics and looking at the biochemistry and then looking at really high resolution imaging is that most patients have mutations that are rod specific. Their rod photoreceptors die first. There's a few cases where the patients have mutations in cone specific genes and those are like achromatopsia, blue cone monochromacy, red green color blindness. But almost all the rest of those 265 are rod specific or rod killing mutations. So, what you see in the clinic is that there's a few cases. One is congenital stationary night blindness, which is very rare as a bipolar cell. But there's a nystagmus that's in amacrine cells. Glaucoma is probably something to do with ganglion cells, but the rest of them are up here in the rod photoreceptor layer. And so what you see in the very, very late stage disease patients with inherited retinal degeneration is that they end up with basically no rods and no cones, but the imaging suggests that they still have the second and third order neurons, the bipolar cells and the ganglion cells for decades. So what I'm gonna do for this talk is explain something about the first part, and then at the end I'll talk about therapies for patients that no longer have any photoreceptors. So uh, when I was a postdoc at Joel Stein, we got a few donor eyes that were quite informative. And this is a 17-year-old patient that had a, a retinitis pigmentosa mutation. You can see this is the typical appearance that you see in a inherited retinal degeneration patient is that they have healthy RPE and choroid, and in the central retina, here's in the macula and the fovea, they have quite intact, if not normal, foveal cones and macular rods. And uh, you can see as you move out of the macula, you see progressively more and more degeneration of the photoreceptors. Here's photoreceptors with short outer segments, but there's good RPE and good choroid. And as you move up further, you can see that there's highly disorganized photoreceptors here. With, there's just one short outer segment. So most of the patients for the, most of those mutations end up with some progression like this. Now there's a few examples where the disease mutation is in the retinal pigment epithelium. One of those is choroideremia, and this is a case of a woman that was a carrier for choroideremia. So she had patches of area where the choroideremia gene was expressed and other areas where it wasn't. You can see here's an area where the RPE is normal, 
Um, and you can see normal photoreceptors. Here's an area where the RPE is abnormal, and we have very truncated photoreceptors. Here's sort of an edge of one of these punched out areas where there's photoreceptors until there's no more RPE. And then there's areas with no RPE and no photoreceptors. So this is a very rare situation. But this is a defect where the retinal pigment epithelium has the disease mutation and it kills the photoreceptors as a result of killing the retinal pigment epithelium. So this is actually quite rare from what we know of what the genetics of the diseases are. Okay, so Spark Therapeutics got the first gene therapy approved last year for any disease for Leber's congenital amaurosis type 2. And when you talk to patients, they are scratching their head, especially if we're in a big meeting with lots of patients, is why in the world would you pick that because my family doesn't have it or it's so rare or whatever. It actually is quite rare and it's quite a bit not representative of what I just told you and that LCA2 is a defect in the retinal pigment epithelium, but unlike choroideremia, it doesn't kill the retinal pigment epithelium. It's a defect in the vitamin A cycle. And in those patients, one of the reasons that it's a good choice for gene therapy is that they have intact pigment epithelium and intact photoreceptors for decades. That gives you a a very long window to treat those patients because the cells aren't dying. And they have a huge uh, sensitivity loss because the defect is in the enzyme that makes 11 cis retinal, and that uh, is the photopigment chromophore for all the cones and the rods. So the patients have such bad vision, they have nystagmus, and they have very early loss of sensitivity because they can't make any chromophore because their defect is in the enzyme that makes 11 cis retinal. But also, if you put this back, and these patients are recessive null for it, so therapy is to give them a normal copy of the enzyme to make retinol, they get a 5,000-fold increase in sensitivity in a couple weeks because the cells that make the 11 cysts, the RPE, are intact, and the photoreceptors are largely intact. They just don't have any photopigment. So what happens here, this is the visual cycle, and the defect in those patients is in this enzyme here that makes 11 cis retinol, comes out of the retinal pigment epithelium, is transferred to the photoreceptors, and then after you hit it with light, it turns back and goes back to the RPE and is recycled again. So these patients have a defect in this. So even though it's a very good candidate and the patients get much better quickly, it's actually not representative of therapy that's gonna work for most of the patients because as I said at the beginning, most of the patients having defects that are killing their rod photoreceptors, later they're losing their cone photoreceptors, they're not having defects in very few cases in the RPE, and then one of the other conditions, choroideremia, the defect is actually killing the RPE. So this LCA2 is actually pretty anomalous. The actual reason that that was the first gene therapy for ophthalmology or anything else is sort of serendipitous. In my previous job when I was in Gainesville, Bill Houseworth was in the lab next door to me and he got a call from Gus Aguirre, who's a veterinarian at UPenn, and he had a dog that was bred as a show dog that spontaneously got LCA2. And so that was really the uh, instigation of this project. It wasn't designed by a company. It wasn't designed to uh, treat the largest number of patients or have the best phenotype. It was pretty serendipitous that the dog appeared with that mutation and that the characteristic of disease is actually quite amenable to gene therapy. So here's a slide from Sam Jacobson that suggests if you're going to do gene therapy for other diseases, maybe the ones that are more typical of what you see in the clinic, it depends where in the state of the degeneration the patient is as to what therapies are going to be appropriate for them. So in the case where the retina is normal looking, where they have the full complement of rods and cones, you probably have more options. And one of the options would be, like in the case of LCA2 with Spark, you identify the gene defect in the patient. In that case, it's the enzyme RPE65. And you put back a normal copy. You correct that one gene defect. And as long as all the cells are still there and you can put back that one gene, that's probably the best therapy. No one's going to beat that with anything else. However, as the patients are in later and later stages, they're losing photoreceptors. Some stages, the retina is getting edematous and getting thicker. It's ultimately getting thinner. At the very end stage, they don't have any photoreceptors at all. They have no rods and no cones. So no matter how good your gene therapy is and how well you know exactly what's wrong with these patients, you can't do gene replacement because the cells you're going to do the gene replacement for, in this case, are not there anymore. So 
I'll talk about a few examples of therapies that we're working on to try to treat patients that are in the early stages. And at the end, if I have time, we'll talk about a new field of optogenetics where the idea is to add a new gene to these second order neurons that look like they survive clinically, but they're not light sensitive. So as I said, the gene therapy for almost all of the 260 something mutations is gonna be targeted primarily to rods because that's where the site of the mutation is in almost all cases. So what you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna to wanna to put the therapy between the photoreceptor layer and the retinal pigment epithelium. And so what you can see here, no matter what stage you're at, whether your idea is that the patient has large numbers of rods and cones and you want to slow their therapy by either giving them stem cells or if you know what the gene is and that you have a tool to deliver it, you give them back a copy of that gene, or if you want to give them new photoreceptors and new RPE cells, in many cases what you need to do is you need to do surgically a subretinal injection because you have to put either the virus or the cell in the subretinal <coughs> space. And in the SPARC trial, all the patients are treated by subretinal injection. And there's about 10 other companies that are doing clinical trials in various stages and different clinics, and all those, with one or two exceptions, are subretinal surgeries. And so what you would like, for some examples, is to switch that from subretinal to uh, intravitreal approach. One of the reasons for that is that it would be surgically much easier. It's more akin to what you do with a Lucentis injection. Also, it gives you a much bigger area of the retina that you can potentially treat, and the surgery is going to be much less complicated. Okay, so one of the challenges is the viruses that people are using for clinical trials, particularly the one that Spark uses, were not isolated from ocular tissue. They were oculated from patients, from serum, or from different systemic uh, tissues like the liver, or the kidney, or the lung. They're not necessarily optimized to transfer uh, the gene that's in that virus to retina. What's nice about it is that, in the case of Spark, if you put that virus in the subretinal space, it's actually quite good at transferring the gene for RPE65 to the retinal pigment epithelium. But it wasn't engineered, it's really just serendipitous that it does that. But an example for almost all of these where the patients are recessive patients, where they're missing an enzyme, where they're missing a protein, and you know exactly what it is, and it's only one gene, the therapy will be the most elegant one would be to replace that, and that's what Spark does. And in those cases, almost always the target's gonna be rods and cones, except for in the case of LCA2 and choroideremia, where it's RPE. And in glaucoma, it may be retinal ganglion cells. The jury's still out for what the target and the mechanisms are for glaucoma. It turns out for a secreted factor, there's a couple groups that are trying to do the genetic version of Lucentis and Ilea. So S-split is a soluble VEGF receptor. It looks like it doesn't really matter because like you're doing with an injection of Lucentis into the vitreous, all that matters is the amount of the dose, if you will, of the protein. And if it's secreted, it doesn't really matter what cell it's secreted it from. It matters how much and where it goes in the retina. So in this case, it probably doesn't really matter if you get it in the RPE or the photoreceptors or some other cell. And you probably wouldn't want to do a subretinal injection for this because it seems like it's an unnecessary surgery to make a detachment. So fortunately, the gene therapy trials for LCA2 and the other conditions are actually going quite well. Now there's 244 eyes, it's probably more than that by this week, that have been injected with different virus vectors in the different trials. So far, there's been not a single what FDA calls an adverse event where it was uncontrollable uveitis or a tumor or no one's been enucleated so far. So it looks like it's quite safe as far as using viruses in the subretinal space. And the FDA is getting more comfortable with this idea of doing a subretinal injection of a virus to deliver a gene for an eye disease. The um, interesting thing is the FDA, their outcome measures that they accept for these trials is remarkably low tech. They don't allow OCT, they don't allow electrophysiology, they don't allow visual fields, they allow acuity, and Spark has built an obstacle course, which you've probably seen, where the kids navigate through a dimly lit room. So the FDA does not like, for these trials, most of the things that you use in the high-tech clinic as a readout. They want the lowest tech readout as possible, maybe because they're more reproducible in different centers. So they don't allow any of these things for the LCA2 trial. 
which is sort of surprising. So there's quite a few that are ongoing that are not approved. Spark is actually approved for commercialization for LCA2. You can write a prescription for it now. The biggest concern with that when you talk to patients is the price where it's $800,000 per patient. Um, choroideremia is in the phase <laughs> one, two in several different centers, and there are several other uh, genes that are in several different uh, stages of phase one, two. And one of the things that's surprising is that some of these incredibly rare conditions have multiple clinical trials run by multiple companies for the same very rare disease. And in many cases, there's absolutely none of the 250 genes that are known that anyone's looking at. And so the reason for this is sort of the same as what I said at the beginning, is that these are not picked on the basis of their prevalence. They're sort of picked at the ones that they have a gene that fits in the virus and that the, the gene is known and the size of the, and the, uh, of the gene and the way it's, it works biochemically is understood. So to some extent, these companies are running on the basis of a trial and picking a disease on the basis of what their toolbox fits, not what the patient need is. So it goes on, there's more and more. But you see for RP65, there's more than three companies that are working on the same disease. The projections are there's maybe 2,000 or less patients with RP65 defects in North America. Okay, so one of the things we did in the lab for the last couple of years is try to see if we could re-engineer the virus that people are using. Everyone's using adeno-associated virus. What's good about adeno-associated virus is it's incredibly safe. About 80% of the population are already serum positive for it. You've been infected for somewhere in the hospital by it. It doesn't cause any pathology in the normal case. And it looks like, in many cases, it's good. In the case of uh, LCA2, it's good at transfecting retinal pigment epithelium in just the serotype that naturally occurs. However, one of the things it doesn't do is it doesn't penetrate through the retina from the vitreous. And that's the reason for the surgery requiring the subretinal injection. So what you see is that if you take unmodified AAV, serotype 2 or the other naturally occurring serotypes 1 through 9, if you take a normal eye, whether it's a mouse or a macaque, and you inject those particles into the vitreous, they only go to the first layer of cells. You see them very efficiently transfect retinal ganglion cells, but you see no viruses in the middle of the retina and absolutely none in the photoreceptor and RPE. If you put the same virus in the subretinal space with a bleb, what you see is they're very good at infecting photoreceptors and RPE, but by the same token, they don't travel backwards towards the ganglion cell layer at all. And so here's some examples that we did early on just to show the difference. If you take one of these viruses, this is AAV2, and you put a green fluorescent protein in it so you can see um, where it goes, if you put it in the subretinal space, you can see it basically makes expression of the gene of interest. This could be the disease treatment gene, but here it's the fluorophore. It makes the treatment the size of the bleb and the locations of the bleb. So when a surgeon's making the bleb, the bleb is sort of a random shape, and it's in some cases a random location because the surgeon may put the needle here and the bleb may migrate towards the periphery. If you do the same virus with the same volume with the exact same gene, you do it in the vitreous, you see you get expression all the way out to the aura, but in this case, these are retinal ganglion cells. In this case, it's photoreceptors and RPE. So that's what's diagrammed here. And in most of the patients, what's happening is the treatment in the clinical trials is a subretinal injection of under 200 microliters into the subretinal space between the photoreceptors and the RPE. And what you're doing is you're putting the particles in contact with the cells you want them to treat. And the reason for that is that these viruses look for cell surface receptors. And the receptors they look for, the naturally occurring ones, are really common because the wild type version of those viruses, their goal in life is to get as many cells as your body as possible to copy themselves and give you influenza or whatever they're encoding. And so they're looking for very common receptors like heparin sulfate, glycans, and the FGF receptor that in the retina are very, very common on the interlimiting membrane. And so what you see is that um, if you put them here, they basically, it isn't that they're not uh, small enough to percolate through the retina. Initially, people thought the size of the particle was so big, even though they're only 20 nanometers, they just couldn't get through the spaces between the cells. It's that they find so many things to stick to 
in the ILM and the ganglion cell layer, they basically get used up if you inject them in the vitreous. And the same token if you put them in subretinal space, is the edge of the initial bleb that the surgeon makes, is the virus doesn't go any further than that bleb, and it doesn't go from the subretinal space back into the retina at all. So what we did a couple of years ago, we tried to make libraries. We made millions of different AAV viruses by making every possible substitution in the proteins on the surface, and we wanted to screen them and these are ones that didn't occur in nature. We wanted to look for properties that were attuned and uh, specific for our needs in ophthalmology. And that, in this case, is to penetrate through the retina from the vitreous and get to the RPE in the photoreceptor layer. So the way we did this is we took the gene that encodes the outside surface of the virus. And that virus has 52 copies of three different proteins. We made every possible change that you could make in it. So we made uh, mutations, we made uh, what we call shuffling. We took different viruses and we sh cut them up and shuffled them together. We also put peptides on the outside. Then we took these libraries, and on paper, this is 100 million different AAV virus variants that don't occur in nature. And then we had to design a screen. And so in our case for the eye, the screen is to inject the libraries of all these millions of variants into the vitreous and then wait a few days and then collect the retina and look for which ones that won in this competition for getting to the photoreceptors in the RPE. And what you can see is that as you do this, what we did is we inject it into a monkey or a mouse. We wait a few days, we isolate the retina, we take out the winners, if you will, then we do it again. We go around and around and around, and we narrow it down from the 100 million to a very small number. What you can see is that about round three, they start to converge, and you get some that are very specific for retinal ganglion cells, and you start to get some that are better at penetrating through the retina and getting to the RP and photoreceptor. So we have two goals. The viruses have to get from the vitreous to the subretinal space without a subretinal injection, but they also have to still be able to infect <coughs> the targets, which are photoreceptors and RPE. So that's what's shown here. You make the library, you inject it in the vitreous. We've most recently done this in macaque. You isolate the retina. You take out the viruses that have made it to the outer retina. You select those few. You do it again. You keep doing it again. You pick a narrow and narrower subset, and you go back around again. And so one of the best ones that we found from the vitreous will transduce the entire macula and fovea from the vitreous side with no subretinal injection. What we see is you get further outside of the central retina that's not as good, and the interlimiting membrane in a macaque is probably the major barrier that we need to conquer. But for this, we see that we're able to transfect the entire fovea and macula. So you can see here, here's one that was optimized for retinal ganglion cells. So here is the retinal ganglion cell output of the macula and the fovea, and here's another one that shows all the foveal cones transfected from an intravitreal injection. This is 50 microliters of one of the best variants that we selected. And in cross-section, you can see it's very efficient in infecting the retina and the central retina. You can see these areas here, which I showed you as the spotty areas in the fundus picture. What you see is where there's a retinal vessel that's against the inner retina. It looks like the retina's thinner and the viruses will get through there. In the areas between the vessels, it still has a big barrier by the interlimiting membrane. So it looks like the ILM barrier where there's a blood vessel that touches is actually less of a barrier for the virus. We also found one that infects Mueller cells and no other cells. So for some uh, applications, like secreting s split, for example, for neovascular AMD, this may be a good target because it's a radial glia that runs through the retina. It goes from aura to aura, and you can easily get to the end feet of Mueller cells from the vitreous. So another therapy that's coming on for patients that are not recessive, all the patients that are being treated in those trials I showed you on the previous slide, they have recessive RP in that they're missing some component. So patients that have dominant usually make a toxic protein. And so giving them a normal copy is not going to be enough. So Editas, for example, one of their first targets for CRISPR gene therapy is uh, CEP290, another rare inherited retinal degeneration. But instead of putting back CEP290, they've generated this virus, which has a, a Cas9 CRISPR, which will mute, take the mutations out of the Cas9 gene and swap them back to the wild type sequence. So they're recruiting patients now. The virus they're using is AAV5, so they're going to use a subretinal injection approach for this. And one of the issues is going to be that the area that's treated is going to be the size of the bleb. 
And the surgeon is going to be nervous when they're making a really big web, and maybe even more nervous if you're detaching the fovea and the macula. For other diseases, the uh, CEP290 approach with one virus doesn't work, and so um, there's a group that's trying to fix mutations of rhodopsin, and for that, they need to make two viruses because uh, CRISPR is actually too big to fit in a single AV virus. Another project that we've been doing for a couple years is in collaboration with Jose Sahel, who's at the Institute of Vision in Paris. And what Jose found is what I showed you at the beginning is that we now know that almost all of those mutations kill rods, but many of the patients ultimately go blind, and the gene defects in the cones are pretty much only color blindness. So what's happening is that they found is that genetically normal cones require a secreted factor that they get from rods and that's called rod-derived cone viability factor. And what happens is that the rods secrete this factor and it controls the glucose uptake of cones. And when the rods finally get to about half or two-thirds of them missing, you start to see patients are losing cones even though the cones are genetically normal. The reason for that is that they're losing this factor that's secreted. So the therapy that we've been working on is can you just put back the rod-derived cone viability factor even though it's not going to help you keep the patient's rods around, can you keep the cones around by supplying the secreted factor? So the diagram of how it works is that um, rods secrete this factor called RDCVF. It binds to a receptor that's only on cones called Bacigen 1. And what that receptor does is it controls a glucose transporter. So the reason that cones die in these patients is that even though they have plenty of glucose in the subretinal space, and you can even inject glucose, it doesn't work because they won't transport it in unless they have the RDCVF. So when the rods are gone, the source of the RDCVF are, is gone. So the cones are actually starving in the presence of plenty of glucose just because they won't take it up. So the therapy is, can you just add RDCVF and secrete it and keep the cones around? And so you can see here, here's a set of experiments where we put a virus with the gene for RDCVF and the upper panel is eyes in mice that have uh, inherited rod disease. And you can see that the, the red is the number of cones. They're losing dramatic numbers of cones. You can see if you add back RDCVF, the number of cones in the other eye of the same mouse is dramatically much more. You can see here the difference between the uninjected eye and the injected eye. So even though this is far from a perfect therapy and that doesn't help the patient's rod mutation, it looks like if you supply this factor, the patients may be able to keep their central cones for quite a while. Uh, we've recently done this in a transgenic pig model um, that Maureen McCall made of, of RP. And you can see here's the number of cones in a wild type pig. Here's in the RP pig, there's basically just little nubs of cones. And here's an eye that's injected with the AAV for RDCVF in the vitreous um, with the same mutation. So it's showing that most of the cones in a pig, and surprisingly, pigs have more cones than people. I, I was surprised to find out. It's actually quite good at. An intravitreal injection will keep the cones around in this transgenic pig for months. Okay, so the last part of the talk, I'll talk about patients that no longer have the option of what we just talked about, where they no longer have any rods and cones. One of the therapies is to do what we call optogenetics, is that they have functional surviving inner retinal ganglion cells and bipolar cells. And this is the basis for the prosthetic electronic chip that Second Sight makes, is that they put a set of electrodes hooked up to a camera on the patient's inner retina, and that that system, even though it's quite uh, clunky, actually does provide some motility vision for patients. So that shows that these cells are functional, they're just not light sensitive, and they're connected to the visual cortex for many years. And so what we thought is, could you use a virus gene therapy to add a new gene, not replacing a gene, a new gene that adds light sensitivity to the inner retina of these patients? And that's these patients here that no longer have these options. So the idea is to do this instead of do this, where the patient has to wear a camera plus a grid electrode plus a wire that goes out of the eyeball into the uh, temple, and then there's a box with a battery and goggles. It's quite complicated. We thought maybe in the inner retina, could you just add a light-sensitive protein with gene therapy to the surviving inner retinal cells? And so what we found is that in blind mice, RD1 mice that have no photoreceptors at all, they have no rods and cones, the limitations of other approaches that people have tried is that the sensitivity for optogenetics has been so low 
that the patients that are tried in the RetroSense trial, for example, they can only see at the brightest, like Florida at the beach at noon intensities, 10 to the 15 photons per square centimeter. At any intensity less than that, they can't see anything. So what we wanted to do is to design a therapy that would work in normal lighting conditions, sort of like we're in now, and be fast enough so that patients could have motility. And so we're using the same viruses that I showed you. It's an intravitual approach. It's really uh, amenable to an intravitual approach because we're trying to infect ganglion cells, not photoreceptors. So this is a relatively easy target for us. We're using some of the viruses I showed you earlier that we did from directed evolution. You can see here, it'll get all the ganglion cells that are the output of the macula and the fovea with one transfection. And so we've been using, which many people told us wouldn't work, we've been using the cone opsin, the normal photopigment for middle wavelength cones, and transferring that to retinal ganglion cells. What we find is that it's sensitive enough to be functional in these animal models of the lighting that we're in right now. So what you can see as you express it, it's actually quite fast. This is a 472 nanometer light flash. You can see it responds to the flash in ganglion cells quite uh, quickly. It's fast enough to respond to 50 hertz, which we think is fast enough for motility vision. This projector is probably flickering at 60 hertz. So then we wanted to test how much functional vision can you get with this system. So this is an animal has no photoreceptors. We made a cage with a partition. We train the animal by giving it a mild shock to its feet, and it learns that if it can recognize the difference between a pattern, which is on a regular iPad, on either side of the cage, it can move to the side of the cage to avoid the foot shock. And so we have an iPad with parallel lines that are vertical versus horizontal. You can see that after the optogenetic transfer, to ganglion cells of cone opsin, the animals can actually do this simple task as well as the animals that are normally sighted. And we found that you can do this task over three log units of adapting light. It's not nearly as good as photoreceptors where there are over 12 log units, but it does work in most indoor and outdoor lighting conditions, so it does have some adaptation built in. And more recently, we built simpler tasks. This is just a box that has an animal with a bunch of toys in it, a ball, a triangle, and a cube, for example. And what you can see is the untreated RD1 mice that are completely blind, what they do is they basically skirt around the wall, and they don't explore any of the toys because maybe they don't even know that they're there. What you see is a rhodopsin-treated uh, mouse, which we did earlier with putting rhodopsin. They do more exploration than a uh, blind mouse, but they don't do certainly a normal amount. Here's a wild type mouse. What you see is they explore all the walls of the cage and all the toys, and they make quite a complicated path. And the cone opsin mice actually have as much exploratory behavior as the animals that are wild type, which is quite surprising. And this is just a box on the bench in the lab in normal room lighting. So in summary, I like to say I like to think that uh, the virus gene therapy is getting better and then we're getting to the point where we may not require the subretinal injection approach very soon. So uh, we've been giving out the viruses that we've isolated that work from the vitreous to companies as, as soon as they ask for them. And we think that this, in addition to the gene replacement, we'll start to see uh, for dominant disease patients CRISPR gene editing like Editas's approach. And we also are hopeful that um, the optogenetic approach will start giving some idea of vision, some motility vision for patients that are no longer candidates because they no longer have photoreceptors. So I think I'll stop there. Thanks, Thanks very much. <laughs> Questions? Yes, hi. So this MOPC optogenetic model, have you tried how fast they dark adapt? How fast they dark adapt? Yeah, how they get the chromophore. Yeah, that's an interesting question. All the reviewers for our grant was wondering about whether there was chromophore. And I ended up having to go through the literature. It turns out nobody ever measured whether in any of the RD naturally occurring models, if they still make 11 cysts. So in order to resubmit the grant, we just had to do it. It turns out that the RPE in all these animal models that have no photoreceptors still make about 10% of the normal amount of 11 cysts, which is more than enough for the system. So it generates. And when I talked to Russ Van Gelder, who's an expert at patients that have these conditions, he said, well, of course, because they still have pupillary responses and many of them still have circadian rhythms, 
and the melanopsin cycle requires 11 cysts. So that's sort of hand-waving evidence that they make 11 cysts. But we measured it, and it looks like they still make 11 cysts for the life of the animal. So it could be interesting to measure how fast if you bleach and then see how fast they get the sensitivity back. Yeah, I don't, didn't have time to talk about it here. I'll talk about it this afternoon. But when you look at these things on the multi-electrode array, you can start to look at those things because you have to add the, because the RPE is not there, you have to add the chromophore. Bleach is pretty fast. Yeah. So what is the incidence of retinal detachment with a subretinal injection? Not, not that much. Well, if you talk to the surgeon, it's 100% and he makes a detachment. Right. right? Uh, they all reattach. I mean, it's a question of whether or not in diseases where you really want to treat the fovea and macula, how much iatrogenic damage you do by detaching the fovea. Some people say none at all, and other people say I would never do it. Paul Sieving's running a clinical trial for X-linked retinoschisis, and if you talk to him or Sam Jacobson, the idea of making a detachment in a kid that has holes in their retina already makes them crazy. But when you think about it, there's so many holes in the X-linked retinoschisis patients, there really is no such thing as a subretinal injection because it would come back to the vitreous anyway. So in the NEI trial for XLRS, it's intravitreal, and AGCT is running a trial for X-linked retinoschisis that's intravitreal as well. If you talk to people that do peds retina, they tell me that if you were to make blebs, you pretty much have to keep making more blebs because the kids would keep coming back in. Because you'd fix them at one o'clock, they'd come back in a couple months later, you'd have to inject them somewhere else. So for many conditions, we'd like to think that the subretinal injection is not necessary. You just need a virus that will go through the retina. So I, yeah. it looks like we may have that. Yeah, Paul. Yeah. So based on the economic success or lack thereof with Spark and their RP65, what uh, are companies more or less enthusiastic now about going through the, you know, these huge processes and you know whether they're going to whether they're actually going to make money at it? That's a great question. Uh, we've been meeting with venture capital companies in the Bay Area about these things like all the time, and uh, at Vernum, which used to be Avalanche. Their idea was to do wet AMD with actually one of the viruses that we made that they bought from the university. And their whole business model was that if you had to do subretinal injections, even though you may only have to do it once every couple of years for wet AMD, they didn't think they could do it with subretinal injections because you need an OR and anesthetist and everything. So their entire business model was to do it like Lucentis. Uh, the difference was on their calculation, $25,000 subretinal and $500 or something in intravitreal. So it kind of depends on the approach. So like, it'll be interesting to see many of these companies, they're looking at uh, conditions where there's only a couple hundred patients. I mean, there's not very many sub-290 patients. So, but Spark's price is not really based on what it costs them to get to the clinic. The estimates are it probably cost them $200 million to get to the clinic. I think it's just based on what they think they can get away with. So, like Tim Stout told me every patient that he did, he got reimbursed immediately. He said that Medicare reimburses stuff that they've never seen before all the time early, and then they give them trouble for FACOs and stuff, right? So, I think for a while, right, it may be that they'll sign off on $800,000. But one of the other big issues is how long will it last? Spark has been saying that it's last for the life of the patient. Um, many of the patients are eight years out. But Jacobson and Sedation say those patients are losing photoreceptors at the same rate, so that suggests that it's not going to last forever. So, yeah, it's very controversial how the price, but the Lucentis price space is, is not based on anything other than what Genentech thought they could get. Right? Thank you so much. Um, I'm sorry. Thank you so much for your talk. Just to, just to make sure we have time for our second speaker, um, we'll move along, and um, uh, Dr. Plan will be doing another talk today at noon.